from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Nancy Gross, and I'm one of the uh, folklorists on staff here at the uh, American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. And I'd like to welcome you to our, the latest presentation in our ongoing Benjamin A. Botkin lecture series. The Botkin series allows us to highlight the work of leading scholars in the disciplines of folklore, ethnomusicology, oral history, and cultural history, while enhancing the collections here at the American Folklife Center. For the center and the library, the Botkin lectures form an important facet of our acquisitions activities. Each lecture is videotaped and becomes part of the permanent collection of the center. In addition, the lectures are later posted as webcasts to the library's website where they're available for viewing to internet patrons throughout the world. So if you haven't already done so, now would be a really good time to turn off your cell phones. Today, we're delighted to be presenti presenting a multifaceted um, event featuring the works of our colleagues at the Influential Philadelphia Folklore Project. Since 1987, the staff of the Philadelphia Folklore Project has worked to sustain the vital and diverse living cultural heritage communities throughout the Philadelphia region. Through collaborative projects, research, documentation, and education, PFP projects have nurtured folk and traditional arts in the service of social change. Among other activities, Folklore Project staff identify local folk artists and support their, tradition, their artistic growth. They produce public programs advancing folk artists and traditions significant to Philadelphia communities, develop educational programs benefiting children and adults, and document outstanding practitioners and practices. We're happy to be joined today by PFP's director, folklore Serena Morales, PFP's, oh, thank you very much, director of programs and cultural, and uh, the cultural anthropologist and filmmaker, Tony Shapiro Friend. They will open today's program with short overviews of PFP's histories and accomplishment, and then we're going to screen PFP's latest production, the documentary film Because of the War, which tells the stories of four Liberian women who have settled in the Philadelphia area and who have drawn on their knowledge of traditional Liberian music to create community, address injustice, and inspire action for social change. We are particularly honored that one of the artists featured in Because of the Ward, the, the award-winning Liberian singer Fatou Gayfleur is able to join us today. During the 1970s and 80s, Ms. Gayfleur was a principal member of Liberian's National Cultural Troupe, the country's premier performing arts ensemble, and an internationally renowned recording artist. A U.S. resident since 1998, Gayfleur performs at Liberian communities throughout the country and since 19, I'm sorry, since 2013, has also been the artistic director of Philadelphia's Liberian Women's Chorus for Change. Um, Ms. Gayfleur will join Selena and Tony to introduce a film and for a question and answer session following the screening. I would also like to take this opportunity to um, thank Nadia Kamara, the head of Di Diaspora Affairs Office at the Liberian Embassy, and her colleague Vicki Ward for joining us this afternoon, as well as welcome members of the Catholic uh, League Immigrants Network um, who are concerned with Liberia for, for joining us. Um, and we're honored that um, Ms. Kamara will take a few moments to, to welcome us in, in a minute. Uh, in addition, I want to a recognize um, Marita Harper, the uh, Liberian and African specialist here at the Library of Congress's Ahmed Division. So thank you all for coming. Uh, so if I can ask um, Ms. Kamara to come up and say a few words of welcome, that would be lovely. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nadia Kamar from the Embassy of Liberia. Uh, okay, it's okay. Madam Jennifer Coveling, um, folklore specialist and other members of the American Folk Life Center of the Library of Congress, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I stand here today on behalf of Her Excellency, 
Ambassador Lois Louis Brutus, Ambassador of the Republic of Liberia to the United States of America, who is presently at another engagement and would have loved to be here today and who extends her greetings and appreciation to the Library of Congress for hosting and screening the recently completed documentary on the war in Liberia. In this regard, I wish to applaud the Philadelphia Folklore Project for producing such a relevant documentary frame, film because of the war, which tells the story of four Liberian women who have been using their music and their talents to address injustice and inspire action for social injustice and social change um, for their country. The Republic of Liberia is particularly blessed and honored by the contributions of our own Liberian women artists who have been promoting Liberian and, cult and African cultural music and entertainment throughout the world. On behalf of the Ambassador Her Excellency Louise Brutus, I want to thank and congratulate the four Liberian women who have um, used their music in a, to address injustice and inspire action for social change. As survivors of the Liberian Civil War, these four women who have accomplished, who are accomplished singers and mothers, and among other qualities, have achieved another milestone through the production of this film. In this connection, it is our hope that this film will create awareness about the tragedy resulting from the Liberian Civil War and also create a positive impact regarding the triumph of the human spirit over adversity. We also hope that the Philadelphia Folklore Project and other programs that promote traditional music and entertainment will lend support to more African cultural and artistic practices throughout the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, Mrs. Kamara. Um, I'd like to, again, welcome you to the Botkin, um, uh, uh, this Bakken lecture in particular that celebrates the landmark contributions of the Philadelphia Folklore Project and, um, f and uh, notes the great impact PFP ha activities have had in sustaining community culture and artistic practices. I, I ask you to join me in welcoming PFP's director, Selena Morales. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nancy, and the staff at the American Folklife Center for inviting the Philadelphia Folklore Project to talk today um, as part of the Bodkin Lecture Series. And thank you to all of you for attending um, this afternoon. You're in for a treat. Today we want to tell you about our organization, the Philadelphia Folklore Project, where impactful, politically grounded, and artistically excellent projects are incubated and presented in the city of Philadelphia. And we'll talk specifically about two initiatives. One we'll tell you about, and the second you'll learn about through our latest film, Because of the War, followed by a discussion with the filmmaker, a Q&A, that is, with the filmmaker and with our special guest, Fatou Yeflor. We're hoping that by sharing insights both into the mission and workings of our organization and into its impacts, you will be inspired to think about aspects of our approach and practice that you might emulate or adapt in the context in which you are working and simply being with others. We are also hoping that this presentation will affirm for you that traditional arts are indeed contemporary tools. Sure. Can folks hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Then I'm going to keep going. Um, that folk, there you go. That folk and traditional arts are indeed contemporary tools providing pathways forward that they are future looking, and that it is their relevance and their ability to change and respond to social needs that makes traditional arts extremely potent, powerful, and political. The Philadelphia Folklore Project is one of just a handful of independent, freestanding nonprofit organizations dedicated to folklore, folk life, and traditional arts nationwide. The organization was founded by Deborah Kodish in 1987 at the 100th anniversary of the American Folklore Society. 
It started as an effort, a project, to learn about the living cultural heritage of Philadelphia, the city where the American Folklore Society was founded and where it celebrated its centennial year. Early efforts included massive amounts of ethnographic fieldwork, documenting, documentation of community vitality, community gardens, family reunions, mom and pop shops, street festivals. Dr. Kodish and the team of Folklore Project staff kept that project going, kept our project going, and advanced major initiatives that documented, supported, and helped to sustain a wide breadth of cultural knowledge and outstanding arts in Philadelphia. Examples of that documentation and the, the projects include 20 years of attention to Philadelphia's African and African American dance and drum com communities, including major work with Odunde, one of the nation's oldest African American street festivals. We documented Cambodian arts, African American tap dance, Chinese arts and culture, Philadelphia-based Eastern European klezmer music, Hmong foodways, and much more. Many of these initiatives are even carried forward today. The Folklore Project's long-term initiatives have left an indelible mark on the city's landscape, including through our work in a K-8 school, the Folk Art Culture Treasures Charter School, founded in 2009 as a collaboration between Asian Americans United and our organization. This is a school that centers home culture and knowledge in the classroom and connects 500 students to traditional arts as a way of incorporating ethics, values, and of course, aesthetics into the school environment. Nowadays, as Nancy said, at the Philadelphia Folklore Project, we identify local folk artists and support their artistic growth. We produce public programs advancing folk artists and traditions significant to Philadelphia communities. We develop education programs benefiting children and adults and document outstanding practitioners and practices. We work directly with traditional artists and community-based organizations who are using tools of social justice activism and community-based expressive culture to make change that they have identified in their own communities. And we understand that opportunities to practice valued cultural traditions enhances lives, self-determination, and community at vitality. We do this work through long-term engagement with individuals, through deep listening, employing ethnographic methods to learn about the traditions of those who make change within long-time Philadelphia-based communities and communities that have just arrived. Because of our ongoing collaborative approach across the city, the Folklore Project has gained a fair amount of credibility, which is really helpful when we're looking to start a new project. We produce documentation of all of our endeavors and over 31 years have built an archive of more than 70,000 community sourced histories, photographs, videos, artworks, and interviews. We've collaborated on dozens of exhibitions, music and dance concerts, artist salons, documentary films, and magazine articles. Our, our products are widely recognized, they garner awards, and they are used in K through college classrooms. Today we want to highlight our collaborative practice and describe for you a few examples of how we work with others to advance our mission to sustain vital and diverse living cultural heritage in the communities in our region. A central program at PFP is called the Folk Art and Social Change Residencies. Community members, artists, and activists advance projects that highlight folk arts practices and social justice concerns. Projects are selected and pursued by Folklore Project staff through an assessment of our own resources and capacities. We look at dollars, genres, content area knowledge, our language facility, time, and community support. The scale and timeline are determined by a coalition of stakeholders. The projects are always multidimensional. The artists involved advance their own skills, their artistic practice. They gain skills in budgeting, in leadership, in public speaking, exhibition design, grant writing, contract negotiations, decision making, and relationship building. And the residency results vary. In addition to skills built, often exhibitions are mounted or an article is written, concerts are performed or workshops are conducted. Because each residency is really distinct, it's hard to make generalizations about the outcomes. But all of our projects at their core employ ethnographic and participatory research methods. 
including working with a community advisory council where assessment is at the center of the practice. We set goals together and ask ourselves how we're going all the way along the way. If a project is a year or a project is six years, um, thinking constantly about the relationship of the work to the goals for each of the stakeholders. Funding for the projects um, for the folk art and social change residencies come principally from the National Endowment for the Arts, where we take an approach to funding this work by funding the methodology and the process of doing it rather than the particular programs that are part of it. And that way, as we're doing these collaborative, um, these collaborative processes, uh, when we identify a thing we want to do, a product that we want to create, an interpretive methodology, then we can go for other kinds of grants, particular fundraising for that kind of node of the project. I'll introduce you now to PFP's Director of Programs, Dr. Tony Shapiro Pim. Tony runs our Folk Arts and Social Change Residency programs, and will share with you two examples that show our mission at work in different ways. So, Tony. Thank you. The year was 2011. Losong Samten, an award-winning Tibetan artist, a sand mandala artist, he creates images of aspects of the Tibetan Buddhist universe out of grains of colored sand. Uh, and he does this over the course of days, a week, or weeks, uh, maybe a month. Um, this artist told Selena that he'd love to introduce Folklore Project staff to members of the local Philadelphia Tibetan community. Losang Samten, this very artist, had been engaged with uh, projects with us for years, uh, but we hadn't had a chance to connect with other local Tibetans before. Uh, this is his work, one of his masterpieces. So fast forward to the spring of 2015. We had spent four years developing relationships with and documenting the Philadelphia Tibetan community, comprised of about 150 people total. Together with members of that community, we created an exhibition that chronicles a year in the life of Philadelphia's Tibetans. It offers a glimpse of their commitment to their community and to their culture, coming together annually to publicly call for Tibet's autonomy and deliverance from oppression, celebrating the Dalai Lama's birthday and Tibetan New Year through ritual and games, honoring ancestral traditions and the struggles of those in Tibet through the monthly practice of lakar and the weekly teaching and learning of Tibetan language, songs, and dances at Tibetan Sunday School. It shares, too, how Tibetans, on a daily basis, pay respect to the Buddha and to the Dalai Lama in the privacy of their homes. The exhibition was about to open in the small gallery on the first floor of our office on a springtime afternoon. That very morning, I got a call from a member of the board of the Tibetan Association of Philadelphia. Tony, he asked, uh, would you mind if Tibetan monks visiting the United States from India, monks who happen to have just arrived in Philadelphia, would you mind if they came by to bless the exhibition? And so it was blessed. Now we're going to rewind a bit. We got to the exhibition opening after years of building towards something. Members of the Tibetan Association of Philadelphia had originally told us that they'd love to create an exhibition that shared their concern for the plight of their homeland and for all Tibetans. I spent at least a year and a half following community members around at their annual monthly and weekly celebrations, commemorations, and activities, interviewing them in their homes, and photographing and videotaping some of their cultural practices. Then, as part of the exhibition development process, we selected hundreds of photographs that had been taken over that year and a half hung them from clothesline around our then empty gallery and invited everyone in the Tibetan community to stop by one evening. So that means if 70 or 80 people stop by, that's a, a huge percentage of the entire population. Uh, we asked people to select up to three photographs that resonated with them, images that meant something to them and about which they'd like to say something. And we had multiple copies of each image so more than one person could choose a particular picture. We recorded image, uh, interviews with everyone, some in translation, and it was these statements and stories that became the captions for the photographs mounted in the exhibition. 
while the exhibition included material objects and even a complete Tibetan altar room uh, at their urging. It's just some of the photographs and their captions that we'll share with you today uh, before we move on to our next project, which is the movie. So um, up there is the sand, one of the sand mandalas by Losang Samten. I mentioned that members of the Tibetan community have prioritized educating the broader Philadelphia population about the situation in their homeland. The Chinese military invaded Tibet in the 1950s, and in 1959, Tibetans in their capital, Lhasa, rose up against Chinese rule, and many were slaughtered. Many who survived were imprisoned. The Dalai Lama, Tibetan Buddhism's spiritual leader, and at that time, uh, Tibet's political leader as well, escaped, ultimately establishing a Tibetan government in exile in India. Thousands and thousands of Tibetans followed him, taking harrowing journeys through the mountains, I'm going to quote from the International Campaign for Tibet website. Tibetans cannot practice their religion freely, nor, that, nor can they protect their culture and language in a meaningful way. Instead, they suffer from repressive laws that deem any expression of their identity as extremist or even terrorist. It's the end of the quote. What follows is a selection of the photographs in the exhibition with their captions. And for us, it was very important um, to work together to collaborate with members of the Tibetan community so that they could tell their story in their own words and we could especially highlight how through the practices of traditional arts and other aspects of their culture that they non-violently and intentionally counter the oppression in their homeland. Um, several of the uh, people sharing their stories and opinions for the exhibition chose to remain anonymous so that even on the uh, placards under the photographs, their names don't appear. They're afraid of possible repercussions uh, for relatives and friends at home. Uh, that's a tiny picture for you to see, but I wanted to give you uh, a picture of the scope of a certain issue. On the ground there um, at this uh, commemoration of the 1959 March 10th uprising in Tibet, uh, which Philadelphians do annually. They have uh, laid out portraits of all the Tibetans they've heard of who have self-immolated. That's they set themselves on fire um, in protest of the situation in Tibet. Um, and three of the people who came to the gallery before we uh, put the exhibition together chose this picture. And one of them explained, the top one, explained that in, uh, Tibet, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's actually a sin to commit suicide. So her, her interpretation is that these, um, those who have self-immolated must be suffering so much if this is the only option they feel is open to them. Um, here she says, since 2008, there have been 136 Tibetan people who self-immolated. Um, but as of yesterday, it was 153. So every year, the Tibetans in Philadelphia gather uh, in front of the National Constitution Center or the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia to call attention to both the history and the current plight. Uh, at that... Uh, annual demonstration. Um, children are there as well as their parents, and somebody chose this picture for that reason in particular. Here you can see father and son both participating in the March 10th procession, and the son is marching with the Tibetan flag. That's the story for Tibetans throughout the world. The younger generation is marching forward with the Tibetan struggle. Uh, so every year, as I said, they gather in March uh, to call attention to um, the political situation, but also every year they gather together to celebrate Tibetan New Year, which they call Losar. I'll just read you the first quotation. Losar in Tibet was very exciting, especially for kids. At that time, we'd count the days until Losar came. And if, let's say, tomorrow is Losar, tonight we hardly sleep because everyone gets new clothes, which you put under your pillow. You keep looking at the new clothes, excited to wear them the next day, so you spend most of the night awake. And also at New Year time, um, they uh, engage in uh, traditional uh, ceremonies, both inside of a Buddhist temple and outside. 
Uh, this is a family who at New Year time was performing for the rest of the community. The entire family plays musical instruments and somehow they get even their teenagers to practice every night for an hour all together. Um, uh, one of the family members said that uh, in Tibet they aren't allowed to display the flag, nor are they allowed to display the Dalai Lama's portrait. Um, so here they are doing that with the intention of showing the world that they hope someday uh, people in their homeland are able to do the same. Uh, also on an annual basis, they gather to celebrate the Dalai Lama's birthday, sing happy birthday, have a big cake for him, and uh, recognize him as uh, even, even more important than their own parents. Uh, they get together in July to celebrate the Dalai Lama's birthday. Also in July, they uh, participate in Philadelphia's July 4th parade. So here they are uh, marching down the street, um, an image of the Dalai Lama as if he's being carried uh, in a carriage. And this is a yak, the national animal, considered the national animal of Tibet. Two people are in it dancing, and then there's a line of women behind the carriage dancing um, to recorded Tibetan music. And here's Lo Song, the artist I mentioned at the beginning, at work creating a mandala. So I, I mentioned to you a few things that Tibetans in Philadelphia do on an annual basis, but on a monthly basis they meet on a Wednesday evening um, to actually uh, teach their own community about Tibet to intentionally speak Tibetan, eat Tibetan food, wear Tibetan clothes. Maybe they show a documentary or bring in a guest with some uh, special knowledge. This is a time that they are non-violently um, working to counter the um, cultural oppression in their homeland. And Lo Sang here, uh, creating this sand mandala, says that as he um, brings these images to life, he considers that his own lakhar, his own uh, way to um, counter that kind of cultural oppression. And as he's making this, people come around to watch and he has a chance to talk to them, uh, not only about Buddhist philosophy, but about uh, Tibet and other aspects of his culture. Uh, once a week, they gather for Sunday school. Uh, the kids are learning to read and write and speak Tibetan, which many of them do at home, and learning um, dances and songs and prayers as well. And every day, in the privacy of their own homes, um, they pay respects to the Buddha and to the Dalai Lama. So uh, that was an example of one kind of uh, folk arts and social change residency that we developed together with members of a community. That's a tiny community, 150 people. And another community we've spent years and years getting to know and developing relationships with is a little bit bigger. Uh, it's 15 to 25,000 people, and that's the Liberian community of Philadelphia. Um, it's hard to know exact numbers, um, but it, Philadelphia has one of the highest uh, populations of Liberians in the United States. And it's been our uh, pleasure and honor to work with artists from that community. And we're going to show you a movie that is in some ways a culmination of uh, an initiative that we've had going for a few years, and we'll be happy to talk to you about that afterwards. As a way to introduce the movie, I'd like to introduce you to one of the stars of it, Fatu Gayflor. Hello, everybody. At this time, I just want to welcome everybody to this um, beautiful um, afternoon. Um, to watch our movie. I just ask you to sit tight and watch every bit that we have for you. We are very, very proud that we brought our stories. When the stories is in you, it hurts a lot. But when you put it out, it helps a lot. So we took this time to work with Philadelphia Folklore Project to be able to um, put our stories out so that people know who we are in the inside and on the outside. So I hope you enjoy and thank you for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.